Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Table Podcast, Season 10, Episode 129. He's Dave Bryan, Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being here this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave, sports are back. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, started with a rain out. Uh, <laughs> I that, know, that, right? That's so uh, 2020, isn't it? Mm-hmm, uh, it is. But yeah, yeah, it, it's back. And I, yeah, I watched the tail end of the race last night uh, as well in between those ball games. So uh, yeah, we're getting some stuff back on TV. And I guess hockey's not too far behind here. Here, right yeah and football not too far behind either although you know i was thinking about it yesterday uh yesterday was supposed to be day one of training camp for the steelers pre-pandemic and so that made me a little bit sad that we won't get to have that uh this year some other sad news i do want to lead off the show with this happened a few days ago uh carlton Hasselrig dies at 54 former steelers guard uh well known for being a wrestler in school and making the jump to the nfl and really being just a remarkable athlete for his era we just had a conversation about him not too long ago when i was talking about the best athletes in steelers history and he was definitely a pretty rare dude to be able to be a dominant you know wrestler in in school and uh, what he did in the nfl so of course i'm sure you remember him better than i do but um your thoughts on 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 his career in pittsburgh yeah obviously sudden and sad uh look i'm in my 50s (laughs) you know (laughs) when when uh when 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 somebody passes away like that you know, it, especially at that age, it, it, it obviously hits home uh, right away like that, you know. So, uh, yeah, very, very, very sad situation there. And, and you know, a lot of – you want to talk about a guy that really beat the odds, right? I mean mm-hmm. – 12th uh, round pick. Yeah, 12th round pick. He spent his rookie season on the uh, on the Steelers, what they called – they called it a, a developmental squad back then. And uh, – uh, uh, you know, spent his rookie season there, and uh, obviously too as a nose tackle. They, you know, primarily mm-hmm. as a nose tackle. A lot of people don't don't realize that. Uh, but if you look at kind of the gap between when he was drafted and 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 you know his 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 stats and when he actually started playing in games, that there was the year in there. So his rookie season, he spent on the uh, on a developmental squad. They were first going to try to make a a defensive lineman out of him. Uh, they they uh, he 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 also filled in. I think some as an interior lineman especially the next preseason there and that's when really he kind of caught the eye of I, I think Chuck Knoll back then and and they decided to to, to uh, flip him over and make him a guard uh, he I think he dressed for all 16 games his sophomore I mean his second season with the Steelers and then by his third season uh, uh, in the NFL he's a full-time starter there and and uh, his fourth season he was all pro and, and pro bowl too so that that really speaks to how quickly this guy you know, he he progressed as an NFL player. There obviously fell on some some tough times with uh, with, with some with some abuse issues, I think, and you know ended up uh, being his demise in Pittsburgh. Played his final season uh, with the New York Jets, but even before all that, he was a renowned wrestler, uh, college wrestler at at, at at University of Pittsburgh in in where uh, Johnstown, right? Yeah, Johnstown, uh, uh, and. Uh, boy, uh, you you look at just his accomplishments there and the record that he compiled, and I think the most decorated uh, athlete still uh, to uh, to come out of that city there. And then post NFL, he of course dabbled with some some MMA as well too. So uh, yeah, uh, you know you want to talk about a long tradition of of good Steelers interior uh, players and specifically guards and and and, and pre Fanica uh, type players. He's definitely one of them. He was uh, mm-hmm. he was fun to watch play in his in, in, in his in his brief time with the Steelers. Absolutely. Uh, very sad to hear the news. Thoughts and prayers go to the Hasselrig family again. Carlton Hasselrig dead at 54. Dave, transition to some more Steelers news today. We do have some draft picks signing. No surprise with training camp just around the corner. We have who do we even have right now? We got we got the bulk of the class signed up already, including Chase Claypool. 
Uh, yeah, uh, Chase Claypool, uh, Alex Highsmith, uh, Anthony McFarlane Jr., and Brooks. Antoine Brooks, Yeah, right. okay. and, and Antoine Brooks. Uh, those are your four that are signed, sealed, and delivered right now. Now, I do caution, not that it means much of anything, none of these um, uh, none of these signings have been made official by the Steelers yet, and uh, none of them have crossed the NFL wire yet as well uh, either. So I, I don't know what the holdup uh, is there. Uh, obviously, <laughs> obviously, there's a holdup for, for a reason there. But they probably just want all these to get done and submitted at the same time, I'm guessing. So, uh, uh, you know, once again, not, not a big issue there. But uh, we, we do know for a fact all four of those players have signed uh, their rookie contracts. And I would think Mayo quite possibly by the end of today – uh, you know, the other two, uh, uh, speaking of, uh, Kevin Dotson and, uh Carlos, uh, Davis. uh, uh, Carlos Davis will be done probably by the end of the day, I would bet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would expect those ones to get done pretty quickly as well, because I think all the rookies are in Pittsburgh already. Speaking of rookies, speaking of uh, the preseason training camp coming up, we do finally have some news with preseason, and it is not good if you're an undrafted player or a fringe guy trying to make the roster. I don't know if it's officially official from the NFL side of things yet, but basically there will be no preseason games this year, and rosters will be cut from 90 to 80, when exactly that's going to happen, I'm not quite sure, but I assume before 28th when training camp officially opens up. So uh, no preseason games, reduced rosters. I'm not happy about it, but uh, those are the facts. Yeah, boy, kind of – you need a few breaks along the way, uh, you know, a, 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 as a younger player and mm -hmm. uh, an undrafted one at that. And, you know, the students, students obviously have a have a nice history of – being able, able to find some of these diamonds in the rough, you know, when it, when it comes to undrafted guys and, 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 and really not only that, but kind of futures guys as well too. heck Roosevelt Nix, you know, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of people don't remember, you know, that, that he was, he was a futures guy, kind of a cast off from another team, Mike, after, Hilton. Uh, Mike Hilton as well too. So, uh, it it stinks all the way around. Yes, I, I I agree. But you know, it's just part of uh what has you know all all all, all the sadness that has happened so far this off season here. So extremely extremely hard, much harder now for the guys that for for you know the you know they're they're obviously going to trim down by ten. Uh, you would think those ten that the Steelers have to cut would be rookie first year type players. Uh, and for those rookie first year players that, that are left who are not draft picks, it, the road just got in a, a lot more tougher for them. They, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of them really, really going to, uh, uh, you know, scramble to try to get, you know, good amount of snaps as this thing goes on uh, during the rest of training camp here. Yeah, and I'm glad there's been some acknowledgement of it. I've read uh, some some comments from players like Will Compton, former Steeler John Kuhn, both I think UDFAs. Kuhn definitely was out of Shippensburg talking about how they needed this time. And I'm not mad about no preseason because I can't watch the preseason. I'm mad because those guys on the roster um, are either going to lose their jobs now or basically have very few opportunities to earn their spot, uh, even if they do survive the, this cut down from 90 to 80. So I just felt like the union is not fighting for all its players they're fighting for the stars they're fighting for the top guys but they're not fighting for the little guys it's not even like where the, the union was fighting for let's have at least one or two preseason games and they just couldn't get, make it work in the negotiation they didn't want zero games they were the ones driving the bus of no preseason games and the nfl owners wanted preseason games at least two of them so uh, the union never really fought for those guys in the first place those guys get screwed at every single turn and uh, they're going to have their toughest pass ever if they even stay on the roster this season i just really feel for those guys yeah, and I mean, I yeah, I get it for sure. You you know, I get it, but uh, uh, all all part of the bargaining here, you know. Right. And, 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 and again, the, their argument is the whole, you know, we don't want preseason because we need a ramp up. Every other league is scrimmaging before their season starts. The NFL is going to be the only one that doesn't. The Pirates play three scrimmage games. The Penguins have a play, an exhibition game against the Flyers. The NBA is doing their restart league right now. Why does the NFL think they can get away with just not playing any football until the regular season? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, obviously we're not sitting in there knowing what negotiations are going on and and you know uh, what what the trade off is, you know, in that th those kind of things. And obviously, look, the owners want it too because there's there's money to be made. 
mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, in that aspect. And, you know, I, I tell you what's really going to be disappointing still, and I hate, hate to still kind of uh, lay on this aspect of it, is if, if they ended up uh, uh, giving that up, uh, uh, you know, uh, f- uh, forcing forcing that part of the hand, but yet not standing their ground when it comes to making the league spread out the losses, you know, o- over a right. few years here when it comes to the cap and all, and instead maybe taking the hit in 2021, which will cost more jobs uh, mm-hmm. right right out of the chute, then, then boo on them too, you know, too. But uh, look, I mean, this is something that we've kind of looked ahead at for most of the off season here, once this once this uh, pandemic started, was the potential of how, how many how many preseason games is it going to cost us? You know, uh, it initially looked like it was going to be at least two of them, and then maybe three, and now here we are sitting with with uh, with uh, with none of them. So you know, we just yeah, gonna have yeah. to have to go on, you know. Yeah, we will. And, and to touch on that, since you mentioned it, um, yeah, we're still not even 100% sure there will be a training camp. The reports from, I think, Tom Pelissero in the Washington Post last night that because of the economic side of things and the NFL wanting to just take the whole hit of revenue loss for this upcoming season and the union, I think, smartly wanting to spread that loss out over several years up to a decade, uh, the owners, at least in theory, there's a, there's a report that they may delay training camp until that uh, financial side of things get worked out. I hope that does not happen. It's not necessary to happen, and that just be more harmful to the players. But we're still not out of the woods yet when it comes to negotiation, and I believe the uh, economic side of things will be the, the toughest, most top- complicated part of this process for both sides to try to agree upon a solution. Yeah, I'm going to quit uh, putting, boy, hopefully, you put, put throwing out there, man, I hope uh, we get this solved by, you know, today <laughs> or, or, or by this Friday because, yeah, I think I'm jinxing it a long way there. But I think didn't the league say that they would like to have this wrapped up by today or wasn't that the report yesterday was that they would like to have this wrapped up by today? Including the financial side of things? I thought the financial side as well, too. Okay, I'm not. I, 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 it's hard to even follow this. Some of this stuff. I, I don't know why the NFL needs to get it done right this second. I understand you want to get it done as soon as possible to give teams a, a roadmap for their future, but I don't think it's something that has to be decided literally today. I think they'd hope to. I'm not saying it has to, but, right. uh, but I mean, look, I mean, you've got team. Look, the Steelers are a perfect example that would kind of need to know what what next season is going to look like at least, you know, mm-hmm. uh, because. You know, how, how, how do you plan to, uh, you know, it might it might affect contract negotiation with with one Cameron Hayward, you know, because, uh, you know, he's he, at this point, he's probably the only one that that you would try to get extended right now, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and and now obviously you could change the, the, the company line of not doing deals once the season starts and this be a unique situation and and uh, in other words you know this was a one-time deal because of you know us us having to know what the cap economics were going to be at the time but even so do you think that you know i mean once you get in season there uh in other words, I, I would think all teams would kind of like to know what the financial climate's going to be from a Caps perspective in 2021, at least halfway through training camp here. I mean, we've got, mm-hmm. what, 50, almost 50, right at 50 days left until the Steelers opener uh, against the Giants here. So uh, they need to put this thing to bed, you know, uh, and it just it seems like the, the owners are still hard uh, going hard at the players at trying to get them to escrow or, you know, uh, something this season in order to help uh, help owners absorb the losses. Whereas the players want this thing they spread out. And, you know, supposedly back in 2011, uh, the owners viewed it as, as as giving the players a short term loan. By doing it, but did you see the profit report that the Packers released and all? Mm-hmm. Uh, they're a making couple... <laughs> good money still. I mean, I and look, I, you know, it's not their fault they're making the money that they're making. Okay, mm-hmm. but when it's that exponential, uh, come on, you know, uh, uh, cut cut the guys some slack there, and and uh, we'll see if that ultimately happens here. And once again, you know, if they, if, if, if 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 all the losses have to be absorbed this year and 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 next year. <laughs> Gonna be a lot of cutting going around on around the league, uh, mm-hmm. and, and look, even if if even if some uh, a, a, a flat cap of sorts, uh, it's gonna cost some jobs, obviously, but not I don't think not near as much as it would if if the league forces the players to take the losses all uh, all in 2021. Agreed, it would be 
cataclysmic if, if that were to happen and the cap were to, to tail off $50 million plus in a single season. Yeah, I'm not, I, I think it needs to be done in terms of the financial side of things. The sooner the better, so teams have clarity. I'm all for that. But A, it does not need to be something that prevents training camp from opening. And right now I think the goal has to be just getting training camp open through all, all the protocol and at least just getting off to, a, to a, a decent start to the season. And then we can circle back to the financial side of things and, and, and ensure that up. But uh, for the NFL, at least according to the report, to use this as a potential mechanism to block the start of training camp, which helps no one, just seems unreasonable to me. All right. That's the game. Uh, Dave, and speaking of uh, preseason, again, Ronch is being reduced 90 to 80. You had a list of 10 most likely Steelers to be part of those unfortunate cuts from 90 to 80. The first, the first guy on the list, I knew it was going to be JT Barrett. Poor JT Barrett. It's a tough life as the fifth quarterback. Yeah, it really is. And look, it's hard to make an argument other than, than, than leading the list with him, right? Uh, and especially if Ben Roethlisberger is good to go, which we all think he he will be uh, right now. By the, by the way, boy, Ben looks good, doesn't he? He does. He looks really good. And uh, you know, back back to the list here. You know, there, there's just no reason to carry five quarterbacks if you have to carry an 80 man roster, especially with there not being any preseason games this year. So I I think it's uh, it's really easy to make JT Barrett unless you just know that that a guy like Paxton Lynch. You know, is it going to make it? But, you know, everything out of Kevin Colbert's mouth about Paxton Lynch really towards the end of last season and and on, and really Mike Tomlin for that matter, uh, too, uh, has been positive about Lynch. So uh, I I really think that if you have to cut 10 players this week or or, or beginning next week, Barrett's going to be included on that list. I also think Corliss Waitman, uh, the undrafted rookie punter out of South Alabama, uh, would also be on that list. And, and I know that'll upset a lot of people listening to this who, who would like to see Jordan Berry, uh, gone, but there, I mean, there's just, there's not going to be in game opportunities. And you would think with the way practices would be structured and all, that just not that much time to, to, to get a lot of guy like Waitman in. And then also you have the whole, the whole, uh, holder on the snap, you know, holder on the, on, on the extra point thing and, and extra points as well, you know, uh, uh, field goals as well too. You know, you'd have to have a lot of trust in moving forward. And it just, it just makes a lot of sense to make uh, Corliss Waitman, uh, 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 one of those 10 cuts as well too. So do I get any argument from you on those two guys? Barrett, no. Waitman, a little bit of pushback in my special teams nerdiness just because I do like to kind of rotate in punters so you don't put too much, I guess, whatever stress you might have on Jordan Barrett. I thought there would be a lot right now, but uh, I was thinking maybe they keep a punter just for a little bit just to not have Barry be the only guy. Maybe he tweaks something or something. Maybe just to have that second punter would be nice. Well, he'd probably all be only be a phone call away too. So, right, that's true. Uh, you know, I can't imagine a, you know uh, a, a rookie undrafted punter being snapped up right away by another team on it from mm-hmm. uh, with with eighty man rosters there. But we'll see. Uh, uh, moving forward with list, you know, you have to think it's going to be a, at least a couple of offensive linemen, right? Uh, well, how, uh, how many linemen do they have on the roster right now? Uh, how many do they have? I'll have to count them up here. Because generally they go into camp, and again, this is very different this year, and it'll be reduced rosters, but generally they go into camp with like 15, 16, so you have three clean lines. And maybe usually you go 16 because when, the, when a guy gets a day off a pounce, you'll in the way of a, uh, whoever the case was, Foster in seasons past, you usually had somebody else to rotate it to keep your, your, your lines clean. So again, it matters less this year, and 80-man rosters still may dictate that, but I would think they probably want at least 14, 15 offensive linemen in the camp, even with 80-man rosters. They got so fifteen know. right now. Okay, yeah, maybe they maybe they cut one. They may keep them all, but I think if it is so, they do cut somebody. Your your, your um, guess here of Christian Montana, I think, is a solid guess. Yeah, uh, you know, great story and all, right? Uh, great backstory with him out, out, out of Tulane. Hopefully, everybody read it on 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 Steelers dot com, and I think maybe we even hit on it somewhere on the site as well too. Uh, he's he's a center guard type with you know, and with few more more experienced uh, players ahead of him on a depth chart. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough for you know to uh, uh, for him to to stick around if if the team has to cut to eighty there. Uh, the other offensive lineman I have. Uh, possibly going outdoors, Anthony Coyle. Uh, he's yeah, at six foot four and three eights. He's a bit undersized as a tackle. Uh, you know they have quite a few other, other tackles, obviously under contract. And unless Coyle has some sort of possession uh, position flexibility, which he might, 
you know, I, I we we know about as much about him right now as we did today. You know, he was yeah. uh, he was he was signed from the XFL. Uh, he obviously was one of the several uh, a, a former X, or XFL players to to get signed by the Steelers during the offseason. season. Uh, he he at least from thirty thousand feet looks like he would he would fit the uh, the cut list. Uh, uh, former undrafted player out of Fordham. Uh, once again, you know. I'm mostly, you know, he wasn't given a signing bonus. Not that that that's a huge deterrent in all this, but uh, you, you start adding up the reasons why he fits the list, and and really uh, just NFL experience and that size as a tackle made him a primary target for me. Yeah, again, that makes sense. We'll have to see exactly how many linemen they want to keep. Um, I think maybe they still want to go with maybe 14 or so, but yeah, Coyle could certainly be on the bubble. Uh, a couple of offensive players here. Ralph Webb, a running back who's been floating around for a couple of years now as, as kind of a fringe practice squad guy. And Quadre Henderson, the wide receiver who had a cup of coffee with the Giants a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, Henderson, Henderson's really slot only, uh, extremely undersized. A return, you know, he is a returner, uh, but, you know... <laughs> You know, which has no value right which, now. Which really has no value, especially to the to, to the Steelers, I don't think, yeah. uh, so much right now. Uh, and Ralph Webb's been around long enough that I think they have a good enough idea what he is and isn't. And you would think uh, as, as long as those lines are at the running back and wide receiver position uh, on, on a 90-man roster, at least one of each of a running back and a wide receiver mm-hmm. would be cut. And to me, those those guys, Webb and Quadre Henderson, make the, make the most sense. Yeah, I'm with you. I think Henderson makes the most sense at receiver, and I think Webb actually looked good in camp last year before getting hurt, but he could get caught up in the numbers game. There's no doubt about that because his path to making the roster is is, is nil. Right. Uh, looking at uh, potential maybe one of those inside linebackers to go, and, and they don't, obviously don't have a long uh, – you know, that line and that position is not very long to begin with, but if you were to cut one – Probably the least athletic one uh, rookie undrafted free agent of the bunch would be a candidate, and I view that being a guy as uh, uh, in Leo Lewis, the undrafted uh, free agent out of Mississippi State, to me would be the strongest can- candidate. He he was given a signing bonus of seven thousand dollars, though, so you'd have to to uh, to eat the first of uh, uh, you know the, the one third of that uh, uh, right away is dead money. But I mean that that's 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 you know minuscule dead money hit when it comes to that. So if you did cut an inside linebacker, I would view him as probably the most likeliest candidate. Yeah, again, I mean, unfortunately, a statement we're going to say with a lot of these guys is we just don't know enough right now. We don't really know a whole lot about Leo Lewis It's outside of his Mississippi State tape. So we'll see. Lines are a little thin there inside linebacker, but if he gets cut, or him or John Houston, the other uh, linebacker from, from USC, would not be a surprise. I hated to do it, but Kayvon Walker, the other, uh, the, mm. other the other, You've been talking him up. I have been. Who's going to push Dan McCullers now? Yeah, uh, look, I mean, they, I mean, you got, you know, the drafting of Carlos Davis. I mean, obviously, Carlos Davis, you would think, is not going to be a guy that you, you, you know, you draft and then 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 make part of this ten man cut here. Uh, so I I think uh, and and look at it, it, it. I don't know how much Walker weighs now. You know, hopefully it's more than 278 pounds. But uh, just looking at him as whole, kind of being a little bit undersized when it comes to defensive tackles and 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 uh, you know, kind of uh, flex players, if you will, on, on on the line there. His tape is okay as a pass rusher, his XFL tape, but nothing that really, in my opinion, makes you drop your drop your jaw. You know, uh, probably not uh, from what I saw. What as, as impressive as a run uh, as a player against run uh I, I really hate to do it but when, when you look at uh you know Tyson Alu-Alu and and having to maybe get guys like Chris Wormley a couple snaps maybe at, at, at nose tackle as this thing progresses through camp all obviously uh Daniel McCullers and and and, and a rookie and Carlos Davis I I just I there's no way mm-hmm. I could I could carve out a spot for him so uh obviously if, if Kayvon Walker end up making this this uh this this cut of 10 he hard pressed to make the final cut, right? So uh, it just seems like it would be hard to get a guy like that any snaps in in in, in training camp practices. 
It would. I expect at least one, maybe even two defense alignment to be part of this cut because if, you, if you've been to a training camp before, you know the guys that probably get the fewest amount of snaps throughout the entire training camp are like your very, very reserve backup defense alignment. It's just so hard for those guys to get a role, especially because the Steelers run sub-package so much, and so you have two, only two linemen on the field, and there's just very few snaps for like fourth and fifth string defense alignment. So I could see Walker. You could see Josiah Coatney. You could see Calvin Taylor. A couple of other UDFA rookies get cut because – the opportunity in a in a quote unquote good year for them is like three or four snaps of practice and team drills, and and they're not going to get that this year. Uh, Dwayne Hendricks, I initially kind of had in this spot, and then, then I remember, damn, they probably view him more as an outside lineman. In fact, I'm almost positive they do. Yeah. The Steelers list him as a defensive end on their website, but uh, I, I just can't imagine with the numbers that they have at the position, and, and plus Hendricks did I think play on his feet uh, uh, mostly. Uh, or, or as an edge, mostly as an edge guy, and and did stand up a little bit at one of his previous stops. I think Miami. Uh, uh, he had a cup of coffee with last there, so I can't envision them viewing him as a as a true defensive end in in, in the Steelers front there. And with the uh, out, Steelers outside linebacker lines not being very long as it is, that's what made me. Uh, put Walker on the list over a guy like Hendricks. Yeah, I'm with you. I think it'll be one or two D linemen, maybe Walker, maybe someone else, but the D line's going to get trimmed up a bit. Uh, the final two, really, you know, how much, how how important would it be to have a, an extra fullback around? Uh, you know, yeah, it's almost in, in the area of having an extra punter, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I- not gonna happen. Right, Spencer Nye, uh, the fullback at Auburn. Look, he's got some some interesting, a couple of few interesting plays there at Auburn uh, on tape that 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 gives uh, that lets you know why the Steers were probably a- attracted to him. But with that said, I don't view him as having very very high special teams value, even though he probably can play it. Uh, and really, he you know he's he's not tight end capable from what I saw on his Auburn tape. He's a fullback only guy, and he was only a guy that if you had a 90 man roster you would use to spell uh, a guy like Derek, Derek Watt occasionally. So it, it's really hard for me to make an argument for Spencer Nye. And the same goes with Arion Springs, a, a, a defensive back, really more of a, a slot defender, if you will. And due to his size and kind of his overall skill set uh, and him coming over from the XFL this offseason, uh, he fit the classifications uh, in in my opinion, to be the odd man defensive back out, if you will, uh, if the team had to cut uh, down to, down to eighty there. So uh, round out the the uh, the list would nigh. So that uh, to recap, my ten prediction would be Barrett, Waitman, Mon- Montano, uh, Webb, Quadri Henderson, Leo Lewis, Anthony Cole, Kayvon Walker, Spencer Knight, and Arion Springs. Yeah, it's just about them just probably just taking from the positions they have the most depth at right now. It's going to be just largely a numbers game just to give them a uh, more well, well-rounded roster with the 80 man. So I'm not even, again, 100% sure when these cuts are going to come in. I assume before training camp, obviously the 28th, which is Tuesday, but nothing's been really made official. So not quite sure how this is going to go. We'll guess we'll find out pretty soon. Of the names on that, on that list, uh, give me two least likely to be likely. <laughs> Oh, let's see here. I go with Kayvon Walker, which I understand why you did because you got to choose somebody here, but I think he's going to stick because um, he's got some XFL experience and it probably just helps him getting ready for, for a, a situation like this. And the other one, um, one of the linemen, I mean, take your pick, but I don't know if they're going to go into uh, even without preseason and go into this thing with only 13 offensive linemen. Okay. I'll, I'll get a handful of these right, right? Yeah, I mean, like Barrett, unfortunately, is gone. Uh, Nye, I think, is gone. Henderson, very much likely to be released. So, yeah, I like your odds here for a couple of these. We'll see. We'll find out here soon enough. It's like the old cut to 75, but under very different circumstances. Well, I hit at least five of these if they have to cut, you think? Yeah, I think you'll hit five. Right. I think you feeling feeling lucky today? Feeling I'm feeling lucky. Numbers? I'm feeling lucky. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I'm not, I'll, I'll guarantee you I will not hit all ten. Yeah, there you go. Uh, because they'll have different reasons than than my uh, uh, well thought out deductive reasons. But uh, <laughs> I have a feeling I'll hit, hit, hit quite a few of them on the list here. All right, Dave, we'll keep you posted whenever those cuts do happen. In terms of guys who are unlikely to be cuts, a new addition to the roster, Dave, you've taken a deeper dive into Dax Raymond. Could you, I think, contextualize his targets? What have you learned about the newest Steelers tight end? 
Yeah, uh, I'm glad I did that. I, I think I think you can really learn a lot about these these uh, tight ends and these wide receivers by doing full contextual contextualizations of this. Now, albeit uh, he only was in what was it uh, ten. 10 games, I think, that he played in during his final season at Utah State. He caught 27 passes for 345 yards. He missed a couple of games uh, uh, there with, uh, with with injury. I was able to locate nine of those 10 games that he was able to play in. Uh, in total, he had 33 targets here. Uh, once again, uh, the... I, I, I think uh, average completed distance from line of scrimmage along with average... Uh, 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 depth of overall target really speaks loudly especially when it comes to uh to two tight ends and on his 33 targets uh 7.1 yards was his average completed distance from the line of scrimmage uh uh, I'm sorry, that was his targeted uh, uh, average distance, 7.1 yards, and his average completed distance was just 6.4 yards. That's in uh, that's in uh, uh, territory of uh, who's the, uh, the the Moss kid? <laughs> mm, <laughs> just your boy Sad Moss. Yeah, uh, yeah the, the one that I, I warned everybody right after doing a contextualization about there. Then nah, there's a little bit uh, less here than than probably what 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 meets the eye overall. Uh, that was very disappointing i think the things alex that stood out the most to me uh on tape when it comes to him were his ability to get some yardage after the catch uh was one of those one of those two things and the other one really was his ability to help the quarter quarterback out uh when the quarterback which which in his case in 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 the final couple of seasons there was jordan love doing a good job of of getting himself open down the field and uh when when plays needed to it to be extended those were the two things i thought that 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 stood out the most uh with him now uh he he just from what I've seen he doesn't feel like a guy that's going to run away from too many people. Uh, he kind of has a lumbering style to him, if you will. I feel off the line. Now they did use him quite a bit out of the slot. Uh, uh, I had the full. Uh, 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 breakdown from his entire college career that uh, the guys at PFF gave me uh, as far as where he lined up at, and he did line up as as a as a attached and, and and detached tight end, but was predominantly used, uh, I think, out of the slot overall uh, that way. So he can, you know, he obviously can play uh, all over the field. Obviously, lined up some as an H back and all uh, as well. Not, not not a shifty, twitchy kind of uh, flex tight end, if you will, off of the, off of the line. Once again, he's got kind of a lumbering feel once he once he gets going off off the line. They're not a very uh, uh, accomplished route runner, in my opinion. They did not just. I mean, you know, I, I think it's obvious by his target by his target uh, average depth of target and average depth of completion stats there. You know, they just didn't throw to him down the field, you know, and, and when they did throw to him down the field, uh, a lot of those receptions seem to be blown coverages or against zone style uh, defenses where he's just working to a spot, uh, uh, the quarterback, fine, you know, and in other words, and there's no wow catches. There's none of those where you go. I, I'll, I'll say this about Thad Moss. Uh, and, and his reel. There were at least a couple of catches, one specifically against Alabama along the sideline uh, with with Dad Moss that you go, oh wow, what a catch, you know. And I always I always look for that kind of wow factor when I go through uh, the, uh, the 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 tape on let's say tight ends and and wide receivers. He's not a he doesn't uh, uh, Dax Raymond doesn't come off as a as a hugely contested catch kind of guy. And there's just none of that wow in his tape. In fact, the only only way only only uh, uh, time I found myself saying wow was on one of his long touchdowns. I think it was like 33 yards or 30 yards on kind of a a screen a tight end screen if you will where he caught the ball like three yards behind the scrimmage and then motored around the right side uh and, and did good good job in the open field with his running and, and kind of burst there uh for for the score there that was really the only time i found myself going wow uh on his 2018 tape so mm -hmm. uh you know 
is he is he still a better prospect than 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 the guy he replaced on 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 the roster in Christian Scotland Williamson? I think so. I've looked a little bit at, uh, at his blocking. I think it's once again it's kind of a hit and miss kind of guy uh, when, when when it comes to blocking, but it looks like there is something to work with there uh, with him. Once again, I view this signing as being an upgrade over Christian Scotland Williamson, somebody who can push from the bottom uh, at on the tight end depth chart. Uh, I, I don't. You know, I, I know it's not a lot to kind of challenge a guy like Zach Gentry for his job, but however, comma, I still got to give the edge to Zach Gentry here overall, I think, especially in the receiving uh, department and the ability to get open and, and, and catch the ball down the field there. So uh, probably an ideal candidate for Dax Raymond to make the practice squad, uh, assuming, you know, uh, he, he's given the opportunity to do so. Do you think that would be taking Kevin Raider's spot on the practice squad, or maybe they would keep both tight ends on the practice squad? I, I, I no, I, I, I think so. I think you could get away with probably carrying just one of them, and and okay. and, and Dax Raymond. I, I like Dax, Dax Raymond more than I do Kevin Raider, but Raider does have okay. a little bit of the experience there, so he's got that going for him here. So. You think Raider's a better blocker? Because I think my my feeling was Raider's a better inline blocker. Yeah, and it's been a while since I've watched that tape, yeah. though, so right, right. Uh, it, it's kind of hard for me to go back and 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 compare. But I, I do remember uh, Raider being, you know, uh, I I think more inclined to be a better blocker. Now, mm-hmm. Ray, well, how was Raymond's blocking? Was Did you see anything from that? Uh, up and down, hit and miss. You know, yeah. and, and I went and looked at a little bit of his preseason tape last year with the Bears, and there's some decent stuff in there, uh, okay. especially blocking down to the inside. And, you know, sometimes I put uh, I put too high of expectations, I think, on – on on tight ends and their ability to block and uh, I'm I'm often reminded when I go back and, and and look at one of those old scouting things that that Bill Belichick wrote up years ago I think from his early days with uh, uh, with the Browns talking like we just want a guy that's you know can can give you something uh, in, in, you know blocking uh, uh, pass catching and the ability to function as a receiver but even way back then was a lot more important to Belichick than than the blocking element they just wanted the tight end to be able to give you something as a blocker, whether it be blocked down inside. I mean, how many tight ends in the league anyway nowadays are able to just to manhandle uh, uh, 4-3 base ends, right? Yeah. You know, well, not, the irony not, is that is that you know Belichick's had one of the best blocking tight ends in Gronkowski. For, for right. The, there's, obviously, he was a great receiver, too. And that's right. probably why you draft him, but point taken. Right, but uh, you know, and and how many how many tight ends around the league do you go? Oh man, that guy's just such a you know who's in the conversation of being other than uh, my boy George Kittle? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was gonna say, don't disrespect the blocking tight end, George. Kittle, right, but man. I mean, uh, other than I mean, uh, 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 name me off maybe the top five blocking tight ends in the NFL right now. You know? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the list. I mean, obviously Kittle, Gronkowski from there probably gets a little bit more uh, debatable. Well, yeah, point taken on that. So, but I just know the Steelers, where you know that's just Belichick's opinion, uh, which is very valuable. But the Steelers have always been someone where you like these tight ends have to be able to block and handle force. Right, right. And I don't discount that. I'm just saying that I've been, I, I feel I've been way too hard on tight mm-hmm. ends in, in in the past, looking for always looking for the next Heath Miller, right? Right, you know? right. Yeah, uh, uh, and, and that's a mindset, you know, uh, that that. In, in today's NFL, I, I got to kind of trade myself uh, to uh, to get out of. Now, uh, you know, and and I kind of felt that that I forced myself in watching Thad uh, Thad Moss tape this this year uh, of, of seeing. Okay, well, you know, probably better blocker than than I originally gave him credit for there. But on the flip side, he just did not, in my opinion, offer enough in the receiving end uh, of the deal to give him a chance. And, and I, you know, personally, was I surprised that he went, Thad Moss went undrafted totally? Yeah, a little, because I viewed him as a sixth or seventh round guy. But uh, he, he went uh, undrafted uh, there, there for sure. So I, I felt pretty good about my overall evaluation of him. I just think moving forward, I got to be a little bit more lenient when it comes to these guys and blocking. Uh, and and I am so I, I feel when it comes to Dax Raymond. I think he, mm-hmm. especially his preseason tape last year, I think he gave you enough there. I, put it to this way. 
looking at his, his all around his, his Utah t- uh, State tape and 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 his and his, and his tape from the Bears during the preseason last year, I understand why the Steelers had interest in him. Now right. the question is, is 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 can he beat out a guy like Zach Gentry for a roster spot? I kind of doubt it, to be honest with you. Uh, but can he be out a guy like Kevin Radar for a practice squad spot or be one or two tight ends on a practice squad? Absolutely, I feel it can be. Fair enough. I think it's a good point on the philosophy, and uh, I, I echo those sentiments. Uh, we'll see with Raymond. Again, have have you watched watched a, a lot of tape or enough tape on him? Uh, yeah, uh, a, a little. Um, some of the stuff, the clips that you posted. Um, but yeah, I, I have a similar feel. It's just it's just so disappointing that we just won't get to find out more about these guys. We just won't be able to right. get eyes on you know a good chunk of this roster because they're going to get cut sent to practice squad, and we're just not going to have that information to go off of. So makes the process and 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 the evaluation very difficult. I mean, Raymond looks like a great kid too. I mean, a little bit older, a lot more mature, I think. Uh, boy, that body transformation of his. Did you see that tweet that I sent out? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh I mean, boy, you got a yeah. That is old strength. Uh, and conditioning coach, uh, uh, I'll have to send that to you right now while we're on, on here. But uh, uh, from the from his early days at U- Utah State till uh, after he returned, what was he on a mission, uh, right? Yeah, he was a two year mission in I forget Russia or something. Yeah, he was doing a missionary trip though, so he is a little bit older prospect. Yeah, I was able to dig down through uh, through through Twitter and 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 let me send this to you real quick and get your get your live reaction here. <laughs> uh, and then up next, we're gonna be talking about. Uh, swole Switzer, so we got a lot of Ooh, yeah, yeah, like like we know what uh, like uh, I, I sort of speak for yourself. Swole bodies look like, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, let's see. Oh, dang. Yeah, that is a big difference there. What was his twenty fifteen to twenty eighteen? Well, kudos to him. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, he we'll looks see pretty. He looks looks pretty menacing on that picture on the right, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> he that, does. that that looks like a uh, uh, tight end you'd, you'd like to have on your roster right there. But uh, anyway, just uh, if, you, if you'd like to find that, I posted it a couple of days ago on my Twitter account. It shows uh, Dax Raymond uh, in July of 2015 without a shirt on versus July of 2018, three year difference. And boy, there is a difference. One of them he weighs in at 227, the other one he weighs in at 247. Six with 10.5% uh, uh, body fat there. But uh, with that, I think we've spent way too much time on uh, on Dax Raymond now. Congratulations to me. There you go. Do you know, Twitter's changing up so much stuff now. I, I can't get rid of the message box in, on Twitter. I, oh, yeah, they, that's something else. Yeah, they, they put that in there. They're all, they're, 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 as my old man would say, they're fixing what's not broken. I know, seriously. Anyway, um, all right, speaking of glow-ups, Ryan Switzer posted a photo of his transformation. Yeah, he had teased this on his IG Live the other day saying about all the work he put in. He can't wait for people to see uh, his transformation. The dude looks good. There's no doubt about that. And I don't think Steeler fans are convinced and uh, will not <laughs> fall in love with Ryan Switzer right now. But uh, kudos to him because it seems like he has put in uh, a lot of work during quarantine. Yeah, he looks swole, does he not? I mean, I, I almost questioned that first. Is that really him? Because it, it doesn't really kind of look at it like him in the face, does it? Yeah, uh, well, he's got the mask on in the photo, right. too, so it's a little see right that's like who is that I mean, that's not switzer but uh boy yeah he does look good but uh and, and look i mean uh you don't i i have been anti-switzer for some time now just when it comes to the roster i'm not anti-switzer the person I think he's a fabulous young man. Uh, new, you know, I think he's absolutely, uh, he's a dog person. It looks like he's absolutely a great husband. Uh, he loves that new little baby of his to death. You know, a, a, there's nothing not to like about uh, Ryan Switzer, the person. Uh, but, I, you know, my job is to kind of, you know, uh, evaluate as a player. And, and I just don't see a lot to work with, uh, uh, work with there now. Will he ultimately make the roster? Look, I think, as I wrote up in the article yesterday, and and as we've said on the podcast, he's got a lot of things going for him. A, he's got the trust of Ben Roethlisberger. I don't know, you know, I I don't think they go to Ben and and say, Ben, uh, is it okay that we cut this guy? Maybe they do. Uh, but, uh, and if they do, you can bet Ben to say, no, don't cut that guy. Cause I trust him. I know where he's going to be at on the field. I know he's going to do the things I ask him to do. Uh, uh, those kind of things. And also on top of it, all those other young kids on uh, wide receiver on the depth chart, 
you know, ha- are, 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 are inexperienced in the fact that they haven't gotten a chance to show anything on the practice field. A, a, several of them are not going to get much of a chance moving forward to show much on the practice field. Uh, and, you know, it's not much as far as what, what, what Switzer offers you as a return man, but at least there's something there. You know, he's done it. He's got the old, he's done it before on his resume uh, there on top of it. So, uh, the further you get along in this thing, Alex, uh, you know, he's a guy that's going to be tough. And, and look, one injury to a guy maybe ahead of the Steeders on a depth chart, got him, you know, got him, especially if it's a guy like Juju or something like that. You know, he, he sure he's only a backup slot player, but if Ben trusts you in that role, that that might that might mean a uh, you know a lot when it comes to that. So. Yep. It's going to be hard, you know, for me not to put him on my next 53-man roster prediction. That's for sure. So we'll see what mm-hmm. happens the way this thing plays out. But kudos to him for putting in. Look, he's got a lot of doubters against him. So, uh, it, you know, if he makes the roster and ends up having a career, do I think he's going to become the next Julian Edelman or, or Wes Welker or, 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 or Beasley? No, obviously. Look, I, I think even if he makes this roster, it's going to be hard press for him to get snaps, right? Yeah, at least initially. But I think Matthew Marksy wrote a really good article the other day talking about this is more in the context of the roster cutdowns, but just positional flexibility and, and being able to wear multiple hats. It's always been a value, of course, but even maybe more so this year because not only do you have to worry about the injury component, but the COVID component too. You know, we just saw in baseball, and this is going to be a reality that all sports are going to face. Juan Soto, you know, hours before opening day for the Nats last night, he tests positive for the virus. He can't play. Now they got to replace him. What if that happens in Pittsburgh? What if uh, Deontay Johnson hypothetically were – Test positive. Now you got to replace your X receiver, your punt returner potentially. You know, guys that wear different hats. And Switzer has that versatility. I know that you know he's not great at any one thing, but he can play in the slot. He could play the X. He's done it before. Um, he can be your kick returner and punt returner. Not a lot of guys can do both. Wear both hats in the return game. Even if he's not great at those things, and he's not. But they do trust him. Ben trusts him. He's a veteran going against a lot of young guys who can't have the chance to prove himself. I think Switzer's got a really good chance to make this roster as number five wide receiver. And he's ch 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 cheap <laughs> <laughs> yeah so another another feather in his cap so yeah i, I think that it's going to be hard for switzer to not make the roster um just because of all the things we just laid out right uh we'll see we shall see all right dave what else do we have here uh we have our inside linebacker preview today we've did the edge guys Last time we talked about some of the inside linebackers guys that could get cut uh, in terms of the starters though devin bush three down linebacker this year right Oh yes, sir. Uh, uh, look, you 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 know what he did last year. Uh, made, made some strides as, as the season went on. There should be a lot more comfortable uh, in that defense. Uh, green dot and all uh, this this time around here. So uh, this is your guy that you drafted him for this reason here. Uh, he he you know he should play at least uh, I don't know nine hundred uh, to a thousand snaps probably. Yeah, and then the other question is, in terms of snap count, is Vince Williams and what their role for him is going to be. They've used him as a 700 snap count of guy you know, two years ago in 2017, 2018, but they reduced those snaps last year with Mark Barron being signed, and Vince was basically just an exclusively a 3-4 uh, base guy. Now the question is, do they expand that role again, or do they try to find a way to – have some other plan to to get a snap count down and not play him in every single nickel situation. I don't know how that's going to go, but it'd be very interesting to watch. You know, barring in, injury, you know, it's not often that you see the, see the Steelers go in, in an opposite direction like that. You know, uh, with a player and and look, I mean, no by no no other inside linebacker uh, in, in the NFL uh, uh, probably rushes the passer as good as Vince Williams does, right? Yeah, I think it's the best off ball. Um, he, I'll have to pull up the stat, but but go ahead. And and in addition to that, you know, uh, you're not going to find too many st- strong side uh, off the ball linebackers that do as good of a job as taking on uh, lead uh, 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 lead movers, whether it be fullback or, or guard as well, too. I mean, uh, just a very physical guy. No way in hell would I want to meet him in a hole. Uh, and, uh, I mean, he knows how to wrong arm. He knows how to right arm, uh, all, all of that, uh, can, can, can get out to the passer. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the real, uh, you know, the real issue with him is in, in space. 
you know uh mm-hmm. that and that's that's been the knock on him since day one he's uh he's been able to kind of uh uh prove some doubters wrong including me in that area but uh i just don't see you know i don't i think I think the best case scenario or a best case scenario is that you keep them under 500 snaps if all possible. Yeah. Most off ball linebacker sacks and Steelers official history. So since 1982, James Ferrier, 30, Larry Fort, 21, LeVon Kirkland, 18 and a half and Williams, 17 and a half. So good odds to pass Kirkland and maybe even Larry foot this year. So yeah, I, I just, if they want to replace the question is, Okay, let's say they want they don't want Vince Williams to be a seven hundred snap kind of guy. They don't want to be out there in all nickel situations. How do they then replace him? That becomes a very interesting question. Yeah, you 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 hope a guy like UG three and another guy on this list that we're going to talk about here uh, at this position group can fill some of those snaps, or you play some more dime. You know. Yeah, I think it would be the latter. I think it would be Edmonds spinning down, but then who replaces Edmonds? I mean, it's a, there's this domino effect. Right. Uh, you got to figure out a way because I I just don't think that you want Vince Williams on the field. I think five hundred. Snaps is too many for him, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, I think ideally 350 to, to 400, you know, with, which with, basically means you're playing them just base only. Right. So, uh, but I mean, we'll, we'll see if the, if the students have, uh, you know, look, uh, it, you understand why they, 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 they release Baron, right? I mean, cost mm-hmm. and, and, and just cost versus, uh, you know, athletic ability and, 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 and knowing where to be on the field. It just, it just, it just made sense to cut him loose, you know? Yep. Uh, and plus, you know, uh, uh, Baron at, at his age doesn't give you anything on special teams, whereas Vince Williams still can, if you need it, you know, uh, kind of, kind of deal there. So, uh, it would be them going backwards. If he, if, if Vince, in my opinion, it would be the middle of that defense going backwards. Some, if, Vince Williams had to take a bump up in, in snaps. And, you know, we, we hear in the, at the NFL level now, you build from the middle of the field out, right? Mm-hmm. With, with speed, hopefully. Yeah, 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 and we'll see. Uh, I don't know how they're going to play it, but there is just the fact that Vince is the veteran. They trust him. They know He knows what he's going to be doing out there. And if they don't have a great way to replace him, then they may be stuck with that. All right, and who's one of those guys that might see some snaps inside? Yeah, it's a guy I've talked about a lot with UG3. Gilbert III had a really good camp preseason last year. Did well on special teams before suffering that back injury. Um, obviously, he's going to be a guy very much impacted by the lack of a second or lack of an offseason his sophomore year. Uh, no preseason to really show uh, anything more from him. But really impressive, a guy that I want to, to have the opportunity to get more snaps, more chances, and someone I was really high on before he got hurt last season. You know, the thing with him, uh, boy, if only we had a <laughs> had you at training camp again and had 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 preseason games to watch, right? Because, uh, I mean, let's face it, I know about as much of him as about what I saw in the exhibition last season, which was was fine, you mm-hmm. know. But uh, you obviously would like to see a little bit more of it. I mean, I did. Well, he not... played two hundred some snaps on special teams. He was leading the team in special right, teams. Right, but I mean, I, that's not hurt. what I'm talking about, though. I, okay. I want to see. I want to see it translate on the defensive side of football. Right. You know. Right. But the fact that he did well on special teams and played so much, I think, was was an encouraging sign because that's obviously going to be his role to at least start 2020 is be a core special teams player. Sure, and I have no issue with that. I just wanted to see him more on the defensive side of football. Right, right, right. Yeah, but what he did in the preseason last year was good at Tampa Bay game. I mean, that that, that first game was was really impressive, um, and it was still better. You know, still got, uh, still did well throughout the rest of the preseason. I think had a blocked field goal in the finale against Carolina. So good athlete, and for me, I think the big thing for him last year was his tackling was better at Akron. He was an inconsistent tackler, could not always finish the play. He did a nice job being able to wrap, drive, and finish uh, as a rookie in Pittsburgh. And so that was a big thing for me, and hopefully that continues going into 2020. My hope, my hope is that uh, you know he he obviously can can uh, you know get on the field a lot you know during his second season here uh and by a lot you know i don't know 300 400 snaps maybe uh but i i don't have any confidence other than just a little bit of defensive tape that i saw last year you know it's all based on a very limited amount of tape so it's more of a hope than it is a a a, a very educated you know kind of guess 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe there's some sort of role they can carve out for him, but yeah, definitely his odds would have been, this is obvious, his odds would have been a whole lot better had he had a whole off-season, preseason to, to show more and, and to bounce back and uh, really continue to gain the trust of the coaching staff to, to ascend in that type of higher role. And then let's not forget, you know, he missed time, you know, later last season because of the back injury and all, you mm-hmm. know, uh, and, you know, that, 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 that train probably got out ahead of him a little bit there. Yeah, for sure. And he said the rehab and all that, but now you should be ready to go uh, for, you know, whatever you want to call the, the, this preseason this summer here in 2020. Another guy. Is, he, teams- one, is he the most intriguing? Uh, I mean, we both agree. I mean, there's almost no way that he doesn't make the, the 53 man roster, right? Uh, right? So when it comes to defensive players, that is he the most intriguing non starter? Uh, uh, defensive player for the Steelers. When you say intriguing, you mean in terms of? Well, I mean, we we just don't know. I mean, we you know a guy that could be become a potential maybe be be a starter alongside you know Bush or mm-hmm. or just be a special teams guy. You know. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, I also think about Justin Lane and what you want to learn from him in year two. But well, I, we're, I, 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 if everybody stays healthy, we're going to learn a whole hell of a lot, or at least we think we're going to learn a whole hell of a lot more about Gilbert than we are Lane, right? Um, in, in what in what what what, what well, defensive side of saying? football? Well, I I I mean, how much are we going to learn about them in in general? Because we're not going to learn anything in the preseason. Obviously. No, I'm saying as know. the season goes along. I mean, we're going to learn what we where we're right. all we. we we should learn a lot more about UG3 during the 2020 season than we do uh, uh, Justin Lane. See, I'm not still convinced that UG3 is going to get a defensive role at least right away. I, I don't know. Maybe that's the plan. But I, as high as I am on him, I just I'm not even there yet with with, with that aspect of him. Okay, give give me your barring injury, blah blah blah. Uh, give give me give me the uh, the breakdown of snaps you expect Lane and. Uh, uh, UG3. UG3 to play. I think it's going to be low, obviously, if you assume good health there. Lane, obviously, I mean, it's really if everyone stays healthy, the dude's not going to play like any snaps on defense in year two. And Gilbert, I think it could be a low number. It could be maybe 75 to 100. I'm not, I'm, I just, I, I don't know if he's going to be their next man up. I think they would rather try to go with more an Edmonds dime package or just keep Vince out there for more, some more run second and 10 situations in nickel as opposed to having UG3, um, especially because the lack of, a, of an off-season preseason uh, is going to hurt, you know, letting him get to that next level. Okay. But we'll see. I mean, again, I'm still excited about him. I was still really high on him and continue to be. Um, I think he's an intriguing guy. I think there's no no argument there. Uh, other inside linebackers, Robert Splain, kind of your new Tyler Medikevich, although he's not fully replacing him because he was playing next to him uh, last year and did a great job the last eight weeks. He's the guy that was replaced UG3 whenever uh, Gilbert got placed on IR with that back injury. And I forget what the number was, but the dude had like 11 or so special teams tackles in half a season, just dominated. And he should be kind of a four-phase guy that did very, very well last season. Yeah, a lot of people aren't going to, you know, uh, Joe, Joe Q, average Steeler fan, probably not going to know a lot about uh, uh, Splane, you know, once, once the season gets started. But he kind of... Uh, uh, you know, the, the kind of a cross between LJ Fort and Tyler Matakavich is, is the way I look at him, you know, and he is a good special teams player, you know, uh, he really is. And I think he has a little bit more athleticism. I, I think where he stuck out the most last year during the preseason is he really seems to be able to read and react uh, well to what he sees across from him. Uh, he had a couple what a uh, uh, pass defense or two, I think, uh, last year during the preseason there. Uh, you know, look, nobody's going to confuse him as a starting inside linebacker, but I think there's enough there uh you know, it was obvious. I, I, you know, I think it was obvious why the Steelers kept him on the practice squad last year, and then uh, once again, it was obvious why they called him up to the 53-man roster too, because of special teams ability here. This guy, like I said, I, I, I think uh, kind of a cross between L.J. Fort and and Tyler Matikavich, and you know, a, a guy that has probably a pretty good chance of leading the team in special team tackles this year. Yeah, sneaky good candidate. Here's what I wrote on him in my camp report last year. Sneaky good camp for him. Average athlete at best, but takes good angles to the ball and is a physical, impactful tackler. He translated, translated the work he saw in backs on backers to games, killing running backs and picking up a pair of sacks already. So yeah, um, a guy that's steady, consistent, good special teams player, very high odds to make the roster. 
Uh, I agree. Uh, all right. Uh, that uh, The other two rounding and out there are two uh, rookie undrafted free agents in Leo Lewis and John Houston. And one of those guys might not even make it to camp. Right. Yeah. Both guys. Um, Lewis, Mississippi State. Houston from USC. One of them could go. Which one? Impossible, I think, for us to say right now. But uh, practice quite at best for both men. Right, and really overall, I didn't view the, the college tape on either one of these two guys being overly impressive. Right, same, same. So that's your group. I think you have your four locked in. Obviously, of Bush, Williams, UG3, and Spillane, and I think you'd be hard-pressed to get a fifth on the 53 uh, of those other guys. Uh, I agree. Do you th- uh, yeah, yeah, they're going to keep uh, – how many How many are they going to keep? Four inside? Yeah, I think four is – pretty much locked in right now right all right uh anything else to add about the uh how, how, how would you view the position if you were to grade it uh top top to bottom um i don't know maybe like a a solid b maybe b plus right now with continued chance to grow as ug3 gets to, to get more experience i've always been higher on vince williams than the vast majority of steelers nation and of course everything's still centered around devin bush and, and the steps he can take in year two for him it's about just the intangible side of things, the play calling, getting guys lined up, kind of taking charge and playing traffic controller uh, of the Steelers defense. That's going to be his main goal, I think, this year, just taking on that that kind of leadership type role. I'll give it a little bit lesser of a grade than you. I'll give it a B minus, and uh, because what, of what's holding them back? The, the, un, the unknown with uh, yeah, the unknown between Vince and Gilbert. I think. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right, Dave, next uh, podcast, we will do uh, corners or safeties. And just a clarification for training camp, like I know camp is the 28th, but they're not going to even really start <laughs> anything until like five or six days after that, because when they, on the 28th, they're just reporting to get tested for COVID, basically. Then they have to wait a couple of days, get results, they get a test again, test negative. And then once you test twice uh, for COVID negatively, I should say, then you're allowed to enter the facility. So while camp does start on the 28th, they're not going to even be in the building until like the end of July. Yeah, I put on Twitter the other day, some, or earlier this week, I think we're still roughly, it sounds like we're three weeks away from an actual practice taking place. You know? Right, because once not, they even get in game. there, still, yeah. Not a game. Okay. <laughs> we're talking about practice. We're talking about practice, not a game. <laughs> yes, us and Alan Iverson, no differences there. Um, yeah, because what, what, once they even get to the facility, they're just like starting off with just weight room stuff. They're not even really going to be, then once they get on the field, they're going to be in smaller groups, so I'm not even sure when the first like actual 11 on 11 practice is, but it's not for a while. Yeah, we're going to be recapping a lot of Zoom meetings, aren't we? <laughs> uh, Zoom Zoom interviews uh, is, is probably yeah. going to be the the uh, the long and short of it here. But uh, yeah, uh, what what are we going to do for the next three weeks? Gonna, Same know. thing we've been doing in the last three yeah. weeks, I guess. We'll little do little our little. best to, to to fill up with content there. Anything else to talk about today, Alex, on this Friday? Uh, let me look at my list here. No, I think that's everything. So we can get to some reader emails unless there's something else you wanted to, to throw in. Okay. Let's see here. If we can find some emails here. Podcast love from, how about some love on some, uh, uh how about some Friday love, Alex? Would you like some, <laughs> some Friday love, uh, from, oh, right. from, from Matt writes in, I'm guessing you and Alex have already received emails like this, but another one wouldn't hurt. Thank you guys so much for just sticking to actual sports uh, during the podcast and not polluting your content with political nonsense. I'm a huge sports fan. and I literally cannot turn on ESPN or any other Pittsburgh sports talk radio without getting extremely frustrated. You two help stress help the stress of this world more than you know by doing what you do best. Thanks again. Well, you're welcome. Look, I mean, uh, we have this you know, Alex and I both love football. We both uh, love following the Steelers and, and everything about it and put two together. It just uh, it makes sense to talk football for most of the time. Now, obviously, you know, some 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 areas cross over that that force us into talking some of these things. But it's it's, it's not what we not what we, either one of us, I think, are great, think we're great at doing <laughs> uh, 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 talking non football. Correct, Alex? You know, so, uh, yeah, we, we just, you know, we, we just try to, you know, two guys talking football. That's what the whole podcast is about. Yeah. It was did he have a question or was he just no, no, uh, just uh, just some love. Well, like I said, well, there. thank you very much. Uh, let's see here. Question from Patrick Donovan. Two question. Let's say Chooks wins the battle, wins the tackle battle. Villanueva and Banner are not re-signed and Filer is. 
Could we see a lineup next year from left to right tackle of Chooks, Dotson, Pouncey, DeCastro, and Filer? Even if Filer plays great at guard, could he be want the one re-sign and move back to tackle instead of hoping to find a starter through the draft of free agency? Why don't, you, why don't we take question one first? Yeah, well, I think the, the short answer to all what you said there was yes. I think that is certainly a scenario that, that could happen. And if a court for wins the right tackle job and plays well, that may be the most – I shouldn't say the most, but it would, certainly would be a logical scenario. If I was a guy that you can just kind of move all around, and obviously Dotson was drafted to play guard at some point, probably more in year two after he takes a year to learn how to play left guard after playing right guard at Louisiana Lafayette. So I think that makes a lot of sense. That way it plugs all your holes because if you keep a core for it, right tackle and filer at left guard, then what are you doing with Dotson? And are you going to go find a left tackle, which is an adventure to try to do in an offseason with probably very little financial – flexibility almost would have to draft one and hope that guy works out so i think actually that makes a lot of sense and then we floated that idea before and something we'll probably continue to talk about if if that particular scenario in terms of who gets signed and who doesn't plays out uh filer man i just think if he hits if he's allowed to hit free agency he's gone it's just gonna be another chris hubbard situation really a little bit better you know uh uh player than, than chris hubbard i think top to bottom chris hubbard got paid mm-hmm. uh yeah. team, teams have cash and cap out there so uh what? Which lineman do you think is most likely to get re-signed? Of and, the and, 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 and it's not that I think it's probable, but if I had to pick between between the ones most likely to get re-signed, it would be Villanueva. And I'm not very confident that's going to happen. If, mm. if, if I was if if if, if, was, if I was uh, forced to pick between Villanueva and Filer, most likely to re-sign, it would be Villanueva. Who's uh, cheaper, Filer uh, or Villanueva? That's a good question. Uh, probably I think Filer. Right, but yeah. uh, even so, I to be honest with you, I'm not expecting either to be resigned. Uh, so you think this line is just going to get just gutted? Yeah, well, I mean, look how, how long have they gone <laughs> without being gutted? You yeah, know? I mean, uh, that's fair. You know, I mean, uh, the unusual amount of time they were able to keep uh, keep keep that group together. You know, right? And if Banner wins the right tackle and starts 16 games, you think he's gone? He's gonna play his I way. think it's possible, man. I mean, I, you, the, once again, it, it's it's what what's out there as far as market value and what the Steelers are willing to pay. And I think the Steelers would just be more apt to try to go and find the tackle in the draft. Yeah, I think I think that's worst case scenario. Like, let, let, under your assumptions, and I don't necessarily disagree with that. But if a core four loses the right tackle job out of the gate, Banner starts sixteen games, plays well, and they basically all leave, then. Who are your tackles next year? Because then you're saying you got to fill two tackle spots, right and left. Yeah, and that might be what you're in for, you know. Which does not seem like a good plan. No, because because you go, you will still have a core for obviously, but if he's losing the banner this year and sits on the bench, what, what, what's compelling you to start yeah, him next year? So you better hope that a core for <laughs> uh, shows you something. You right, know? right. Yeah, it's a big year for for Chooks for sure. But yeah, I think if a core four does win their right tackle job and Villanueva is gone, I think yeah, shifting a core four to left tackle and moving Fowler back to right tackle, dots in the left guard is a, probably the best way to do it. Because other than that, you're going to have to start adding from the outside and hoping some unknown guys are, are ready to work and, and contribute right away. Right. Uh, you know, maybe you go to free agent route and get a cheaper free agent. I don't know, but uh, mm. uh, a cheap cheap lineman free agent with a cap situation. You know, uh, you have to you have to really look at it. But uh, as as we sit here right now, uh, I'm not expecting Villanueva, Filer, uh, Filer or Banner back next season. It's hard for me to see all that all three are going to be gone, even in the context of everything going on economically. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet my house on it, but I that's that's where I'm at right now. Okay. Right, right, right down. We'll re-examine it a year from now. Mm-hmm. But, uh, all right, uh, I think we got that question. Let's see. If you could choose three players from defense and three from offense in the past 30 years who played for the Steelers to have them finish their career with us, so no free agency, no being traded, and no injury, no off-field issues. For me, I went Rod Woodson, Kevin Green, and Ryan Shazier. Uh, honorable mention being Joey Porter and offense. I went A, B, Lev Bell, and this last one was hard, but with the problems we've had at the position and uh, – uh, and the flash he showed, I went tight end Ladarius Green, uh, honorable mention, being Alan Fanica and my favorite wide receiver growing up, Yancey Thigpen. Mm, those are, I was going to say Fanica for the offense. Um, yeah, those are all good options there, I think. 
Uh, Rod Woodson would be probably at the top of people's list for yeah, sure. Yeah, Fanica would be. I mean, you just hate to, just to see Fanica mm-hmm. have to finish his career elsewhere. Kevin Green was another one. Boy, did, too bad he couldn't keep him around uh, for for more than what the did the, the three years. What the about a guy years. like Cornell Lake? You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really good one. Yeah, A, a- B. Um, Eric, had it not been for what about Eric, Eric, Green? Eric Green? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, you could probably come up with a bunch of them here, right? Uh, who else? Right, and obviously. Seeing Franco, although it was at the end of his oh, yeah. career for that one year, was still just the weirdest sight. Yeah, that uh, that caused me to cry as a kid, uh, seeing that <laughs> on a football card. Yeah, most definitely. Uh, you know, some good choices here for sure uh, that that you have listed, Patrick. And let's see. Thank you for everything, and thanks for finding ways to keep us entertained during this time. Oh, and Dave, don't push your wife down trying to answer these. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Alex, I was wondering if you have ever seen one of my all-time favorite movies. It came out the year I was born, nineteen. 19- 1986, the movie Stand By Me. Didn't you reference that recently, a Stand By Me reference? I did, but I've never seen it. I'm just oh. fairly smart enough to get the pop culture reference, and that's as far as I go. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, he's saying uh, Dave T was wondering how he's doing. I have not talked to Dave T. I need to try to check in with him, see how he's doing uh, health wise there. But thank you, uh, thank you for the uh, email there, Patrick. Uh, Ted Webb writes in question for Alex. This is an Alex only question. Uh, with okay. no, tr- no with no training camp this year, Alex, what are you going to miss by not attending camp in Latrobe? Besides watching the players progress and you charting catches off jugs machines, what are some <laughs> of the things you will miss? Thanks, Ted Webb. God, everything. I mean, it is literally my favorite time of the year, so I'm very upset that uh, I'm not able to go out this year. I just like hanging out with Steeler fans. I like the environment. Um, I like how rare it is in the NFL today because most teams stay at home. They're doing at their own team facility like all teams are doing this year, and it's just such a closed-off wall uh, between you know player uh, between players and, and organization and, and, and the fan base. So I just love the environment where it just really feels like football. That's all it is at St. Vincent is, uh, for that moment at least, it, it is football. So just love that. Uh, experience of it. Love seeing the um, you know, unknown guy rise up like Duck last year and getting to kind of follow that along. And uh, I even love the drive to Latrobe. It's a very pretty drive. I take the back way in and uh, I cross over this one bridge and everything just kind of opens up to see the campus. It's a very pretty view. So loved every part of it. Uh, we'll miss it and uh, hopefully get to go back next year. You need to get one of them GoPros next year and mm-hmm. fasten it to your head and live stream <laughs> a whole, uh, you know, have, have a day in a, a day in a, a day in the life of a day at camp for Alex Kazora. Mm. Well, I think Bert would drag me away once practice started. <laughs> I get well, tackled by we'll, St. Vincent we'll, Security. We'll have to get one of them uh, spy cameras, you know. Yeah, and drones, depot drone. <laughs> there you go. We have those. Yeah. Uh, this one from Sean writes in, hey, guys, long-time listener, several-time several emailer. We keep talking about uh, – are you hearing me good enough, Alex? Am I too low? No, you sound good. Okay. Uh, and we keep talking about the free agents we may lose after the season, the depth we have at safety. Don't we have both? Both problems at corner. Joe Hayden and Steven Nelson are locked down corners. However, comma, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't, isn't Steven Nelson a free agent after the season? If so, what's it going to take to sign him to a longer deal? Uh, Steven Nelson is not a free agent after the season. Think he, I don't think he, he is. Think is he? After two years from now, I believe. But he's not after not after this season. There's questions, obviously, about how much longer will Joe Hayden continue to play at his level as he's in his 30s, and uh, Nelson is up after 2021, so after next season. He'll be a free agent. I, I think the big question with him, you know, uh, look, I mean, obviously, if Nelson plays the way he did play last year, uh, uh, you easily spend the $8.25 million base salary on him that he's scheduled to earn in 2021. What if he has kind of a mass season there, and 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 there's and then you have maybe some cap concerns to go along with it? Well, yeah, obviously we'd have to see what the, exactly the uh, financial future is. I think he's more likely to stay. It could also, also be partially tied to just how they feel Justin Lane is developing. If they think he's doing a nice job, maybe he comes in in some you know, role and plays some snaps defensively, injury fill-in, COVID fill-in, whatever, and, and does well. That may change the equation, but I think Nelson will play out his contract. Uh, and, you know, obviously Hayden, you know, uh, if, fundamental. He, if, if, if he were to have – if he were to have some sort of a down year or something, you know, at his age mm-hmm. and, and cost, you know. Right. Yeah. Same thing could apply. Depends on how Justin Lane's doing. Okay. I think that knocks out all the questions, Alex. I think we got about an hour and a half in here on a Friday. That's good. Uh, we'll be back on uh, Tuesday, right? 
Yeah, back on Tuesday again. That is technically the first day of camp, though don't expect a whole lot of fanfare for it, to be honest. All right, tell people what we're going to do Monday night. Monday night, we do our Steelers Depot live stream over on my YouTube channel. Channel Just uh, type in my name, Alex Kazora, and you can find the channel, subscribe to it, and get notifications. Uh, from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Dave and I have a live stream that answers any and all of your Steelers questions. And so feel free to check that out on Monday. All right. Follow me on Twitter at Steelers Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, go to SteelersDepot.com. Hit the donate button upright navigational bar. Also, if you'd like uh, an ad free version of the site, go to steedersdepot.com. Hit the ad free button upright navigational bar for one year, for one calendar year, for $25, you can have an ad free version of the site. Uh, everybody have a happy and safe uh, weekend. Uh, we hope to keep you entertained on steedersdepot.com throughout the weekend here, as per usual. So, for Alex and myself, thank, as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.